Hi, everyone. Welcome to another live event of the MITx Micromasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm Miguel Rodríguez García, a research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics and the course lead for SC1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. So first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody for joining us today. This is the final live event of the fall series, a series of live events where we have invited renowned speakers to share the knowledge in supply chain management with all of our Micromasters learners. So for those of you who don't know our program, the MicroMasters in Supply Chain is a professional and academic credential from MIT, available to learners all around the world who seek the highest quality in online education. We have five courses in total, and some of them are actually open right now for enrollment, so don't hesitate to check them out. We'll be posting the links in the chat. Um, today's event is co-organized by two of the courses, uh, SE1X, Supply Chain Fundamentals, where the one I lead, and SE3X, Supply Chain Dynamics, both currently running. And that's why I'm really happy to be co-hosting this event with my colleague, Jeff Baker, course lead of SE3X. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hey, Miguel. I'm doing great. Thanks. It's great to be here once again, co-hosting with you in the SE1X and 3X uh, live events. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're really excited today to share some great insights about risk and resilience in this live event. So today we're going to follow uh, this agenda. First, our speaker is going to give an introduction or presentation that will last about eh, 25 minutes. After that, there'll be some time at the end, around 15 minutes, uh, when he will answer any questions from the audience. So we encourage active participation in this. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. So again, the Q&A feature, do not use the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring the Q&A feature, and those are the questions we're going to be asking uh, at the end. So without further ado, uh, Miguel, would you like to introduce our guest speaker? Yeah, of course. So today we're very honored to have Dimitri Vanov with us. Dimitri is a professor of supply chain and operations management at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. And he's also the director of the Digital AI Supply Chain Lab at the same school. His research spans both supply chain resilience and digital twins. And today's event is all about uh, the real applications of that, supply chain digital twins. And also we'll see a little bit of simulation and AI. So we're super excited about this because it's a really hot topic right now. Professor Dimitri Vanov is one of the most cited researchers worldwide uh, in business and operations management with over 450 publications. And he has led several projects about supply chain digital twins and resilience funded by the European Union and also the German Research Foundation. So, Professor, uh, we are really happy to have you. Welcome to MIT. How are you? I'm good. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Miguel. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks for this invitation. It's my great pleasure to be here. Yes, exactly. So I'm from Berlin School of Economics and Law, where I'm leading Digital AI Supply Chain Lab. And in the last years, I was a bit fortunate to participate in some cutting-edge European research project and also industry project. And this is something what I would like to share today with you, some recent insights from both research and industry projects. So I, if I can start, I, I'm happy to share the screen. Right? Yeah, the floor is yours. So whenever you can, we can start sharing the screen. Awesome. OK. So, yeah, basically, uh, today I would like to talk about uh, supply chain simulation, AI, and digital twin. And uh, looking not only on the theory, but also on the practical implications. Um, I would say 90% of what I will talk about is stemming directly from uh, the project, from the use cases. And the rest, 10%, it's, I, I say, product of my scientific uh, fantasy. All right, so for, for outline, uh, I would like to, to discuss a little bit why we are now experiencing rebooting of supply chain simulation with development of digital supply chains. Uh, then I would like to look at digital supply chain twins and more specifically at one technology, which is any logistics, which we are using for building digital twins. Here, I would like to exemplify its practical application for supply chain stress testing and resilience management. And finally, looking beyond what we have now, I, would, I will try to project what can happen in the next years with, develop, with a development of what intelligent digital twins and human artificial intelligence uh, interface. So to begin, you know, supply chain simulation is something what we use to imitate behavior of uh, physical supply chain by using uh, computer models. Right. And normally when we uh, use simulation, we try to make some changes to the supply chain, to scenarios, uh, expecting to gain some understanding of dynamics uh, which we 
could experience in a physical system. So rather than deriving some mathematical analytical solutions to the problem through experimentation, through changing, uh, through sensitivity analysis uh, in, of a computer model, we try to understand uh, behavior of a real network. And there are several approaches, uh, for example, system dynamics, agent-based simulation, discrete event simulation, which are there. All of them are used for building digital twins. Today, I would uh, mostly focus on the discrete event simulation and uh, showing how it can be used also for supply chain stress testing. But most important, uh, our topic will be not only simulation, but digital twins and human AI collaboration. So uh, this is my central message to explain that simulation is just one part of digital twins. And actually, digital twin is much more. It's just uh, one uh, simulation model. Yeah, simulation has been here for a while, right? It is not something new which we invented, invented these days. So why now we have so high interest in simulation, both in industry and in, in research? So basically, of course, we have uh, simulation models of physical supply chains, but here some crucial questions uh, should be considered. For example, what about real-time data? What about data accuracy? How visible is supply chain? Right? If we want to build a digital twin, you should understand uh, your network. But how much visibility do we have about networks? How much companies know about the upstream part or downstream? Right? Uh, then the question comes, even if we have a model, what about data analytics? Right? So we have now much more powerful tools in descriptive, predictive, prescriptive analytics, which can help us building digital twins. And finally, very important, what about decision-making support? How a digital twin can be used by managers, by supply chain professionals to improve their decision-making? And this is something what I would like uh, to talk about today, how these questions can be answered uh, from the perspective of uh, digital twin. But before we start, uh, we prepared some polls for you guys today. And maybe it's now the time to run the first one. So please uh, yeah. select. You should all be seeing the, the first poll already. It's out there. So people are answering already. And yeah. I'll share the results with you. Dimitri and with the team in a few seconds. We'll give people okay. time to vote. We have already more than 130 votes. We'll give That's them great. a few more seconds. For, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think this this question, what is what a digital twin actually is, right? Is this just a digital visualization of the physical supply chain? Or is it data about supply chain? Or is it analytics? Or is it simulation model? It's essential, right? Because I selected this, que this question to start with because this question, which is most frequently asked when I'm talking in industry conferences or in research workshops, uh, there is no unique consensus or a unique definition about. And I think because we have so many participants now, it's a very good opportunity to, to see right, their opinions. Yeah, you should be seeing the uh, results now. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So look, guys, so most of you say that uh, a digital twin is a digital visualization of a model, the absolute majority, right? Then uh, say 20% believe it is a data analytics simulation model. Only 2%, which actually very surprising for me, says it's it's a data, data about supply chain. But this is something what I would like to discuss more detail. Okay, thank you. So I'm closing it. Oh, you, you closed it. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let us look at... Um, say definition of um, uh, yeah of a digital yeah so when looking at uh, what happens in industry now i think uh, there are five levels of digital twins Dig digital twins of products processes organizations this is something what most of companies already have it gets a little bit more tricky if we look at supply chain digital twins and even network of networks digital twin that's why we will talk about these levels today and uh, another classification it's uh, how we understand digital twins uh, here i think there are four major components which can be deduced from research from literature and from industry discussions looking at how managers understand so the first components in models uh, this is also what you responded in your in your questions, as absolute majority say. 
Then it's also data. We should not forget that models without real-time data do not uh, make uh, much sense. And data can also help us to understand our system better. In some projects, we even use data to build digital twin, right? So not building digital twin looking at physical system because we cannot observe the whole physical system, but data-driven building of digital twin. Then technology. Uh, real-time technology, sensors, blockchains, industry 4.0, uh, something what can help us to, um, to connect uh, our models with external systems. And finally, knowledge. Knowledge is very important because digital, digital tool should not only replicate human knowledge, but be able to generate new knowledge and help us understand our systems better. But this is uh, a little bit later. So... Uh, in uh, in one of my recent IGPR papers, uh, conceptualization of seven element digital twin framework, uh, I provided the following de definition, which uh, has been uh, followed uh, in some uh, other papers. Yeah, so basically, digital twin of a supply chain, it's on the one hand, the digital visualization, as you told in, in your answers. 60% of you told that uh, it is, first of all, digital model. But it's not only... It's not the end of the story, it's just the beginning, just a fundament. Then once we have created this digital model, once we have described uh, who are involved in the network, uh, once we got this data, then we should update uh, all information, all parameters in the model. And here we use digital technologies which help us to get feedback, provide data about the physical objects, something like sensors, blockchain, cloud, something like Google Cloud or, or Amazon Web Services, yes, Microsoft, as you know, technologies, or even open data spaces. Uh, but even this, it's not the end of the story. So once we created model, we uh, found data. Uh, now we have to do something with this data, right? And that's why the third element of a digital twin is descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. So once we have something what... Uh, where we have all these three elements. Uh, here we can more or less say, okay, now we are very close uh, to, to, to having a digital supply chain uh, twin. Uh, the technology what uh, we are using in our projects is any logistics. So this is basically um, technology which allows us to build digital twin where we can define uh, supply chain uh, as physical system in a digital model. And we can define all the related parameters like demand, products, transportation, customers, suppliers, production, distribution centers, everything what you need. And then the third level, analytics, uh, running simulation, optimization, and descriptive analytics for performance analysis. We actually cover all three components, uh, digital model, data, and uh, analytics. Uh, one example of using such digital twin is supply chain stress testing. Uh, the general scheme uh, looks like that. On the one hand, so in the middle, we have a supply chain model. Um, this model is connected to external systems, which uh, help us to identify risk data. So we are, we are mapping risk data in supply chain locations. And in case when, uh, when we identify that some of the disruptions are dangerous uh, for my supply chain, so my supply chain will be affected, we can run stress testing, uh, test different recovery plans, uh, simulate impact of disruptions, and see results of this testing in performance analysis. Right? So to understand how different disruptions and our reactions to these disruptions will impact uh, performance and uh, how effective and efficient will be different stabilization and recovery policies we have in mind. So just to illustrate, uh, we can look into any logistics. Uh, so basically, if you are not familiar with the system at the supply chain uh, simulation and uh, optimization tool, yeah, in this case, we have a global uh, supply chain where you see blue points are customers, uh, red points are distribution centers. Here we have a distribution center in, uh, in all continents. Uh, then we have uh, manufacturing company, uh, two manufacturing uh, companies in China and one uh, uh, Chinese supplier. So very small fragment of a global supply network. 
And now, for example, we want to test a sort of, make a sort of stress testing against uh, a pandemic scenario. So we define four events, uh, which are, for example, 25th of January closure of uh, factories in China for 45 days, say for a lockdown. And then 15 of uh, April, closure of distribution center in uh, in the United States and South America and Europe, uh, uh, in Asia, uh, as uh, another type of lockdown, say second wave of a pandemic. Right? And now we just want to understand what happens in uh, our um, with our supply chain if such external disruptions would come to uh, would come in uh, real life. Right, so basically we begin, so all, the, all this happens day by day in real life. You see at the beginning, everything works uh, very, very nice. And uh, our, um, our service level is at 100%. Production is uh, nicely utilized. Uh, our inventory exhibits uh, stable uh, dynamics. But when we come, say, to the, um, to the 25th of January, right, when I zoom in, you see that... Uh, both factories in uh, in China are not working anymore because of, because of lockdown, they are great. And there are no outgoing flows uh, from these factories to other, um, to, to distribution centers. Of course, there are some inventory in transit, which helps uh, uh, to cover some regional demand, but here we immediately see the impact uh, of such a disruption, right? So service level on time delivery goes down, we see impact uh, on uh, on inventory, and uh, we also see that, for example, our our financial performance is not good enough. Right, we are not making profit anymore. We are making losses here. You know, according to our scenarios, factories in China have been recovered, but in a very short period after that, distribution centers uh, worldwide uh, will be closed. So there is some very short period of recovery. But then uh, I think we define 15 of April. Now we are we are closing to 15 of April as um, uh, as the disruption date, and at this date, uh, factories uh, uh, distribution centers become gray. Right, so distribution centers do not work anymore. So and uh, yeah, we, when we just speed up a little bit our simulations, uh, we will see the whole impact of it. Right. For example, here we see very clearly in that uh, that our on-time delivery uh, was impacted uh, by this disruption scenario. We see that there is uh, there are two periods: first first pandemic wave and second pandemic wave, where uh, we we were not good in our financial performance. We also see in inventory diagrams this uh, two two areas where, um, where we had uh, uh, problems with uh, deliveries and also in our lead time. Right? There are periods which exactly correspond to disruptions where we had very, very long, very long uh, lead time because of all this instabilities in the supply chain. Yeah, this is what we name, something what we name uh, supply chain stress testing, where on the one hand, we build digital supply chain model. On the other hand, we define disruption scenarios and we make stress testing and analyze uh, the performance impact. Right? So this is just, uh, was just an example to, to illustrate this uh, diagram. All right, so what everything what I was talking about so far was about, uh, I would say, digital twin of the first level, where we actually visualize physical supply chain in a digital form, collect and process data and use them for more. As a decision maker, uh, from industry, for example. Now, after running uh, such simulations, uh, what I get? I get uh, analysis of uh, disruption impact. However, I don't know what are the bottlenecks, right? I cannot see immediately why I have this disruption impact. So, of course, as an experienced uh, supply chain manager, I can look at different dashboards, different visualizations, and I would be able to identify it. But it would be manual work based on human expertise. And um, the, so another important thing which I do not see is our recommendations for recovery. What I should do? Should I increase inventory? Should I use the second supply source? Or should I introduce some logistics rerouting? Right? What would be my reaction to this disruption? This is what I don't see. So that's why I would say what we have seen so far, we name it uh, 
digital twin of the third level. Right? Then the next level of digital twin, what uh, we name cognitive digital twin. It's actually the same as digital twin of the first level, but plus mimic, mimicking human decision-making rules and suggesting action plans. Right? In other words, if we would have, if we would add some components of AI to this model, what we just saw, this model would help us to identify bottlenecks, reasons for degradation of performance. And this model could also tell us what to do. But again, so uh, here we just mimic human decision making. In other words, if in the past we experienced similar disruptions and we know how we reacted, we put all this knowledge into the system. And once uh, we encounter the same pattern together, uh, the, uh, the same pattern again, sorry. Uh, then uh, AI would suggest us some action plans based, based on the previous knowledge. And finally, we, we come to intelligent digital twin. Here, cognitive digital twin, it's extended by capability to create new knowledge. Right? In other words, if we would encounter a situation of unknown unknown, something what we never dealt uh, in the past, something what we encounter for the first time. Cognitive digital twin would not be able to help. Cognitive digital twin can handle only standard situations. But if, if it comes to new situation, new disruption scenario, unknown, unknown, um, we need intelligent digital twin, something where through human AI collaboration, uh, digital twin can create new knowledge and new decision-making algorithm, helping us to understand the system better and helping us to um, in, in decision making or even taking over some portion of decision making. So I think with these three levels, uh, we, we can uh, define very well uh, research and practical agenda. Now, most of, com most of the companies are at the level of digital twins. So first level, this red rectangle. Some companies are moving to what cognitive digital twin. And probably the next uh, development stage will be intelligent digital twin. At this point, uh, Miguel, maybe we can run our second poll. All right, sure. So the second poll should be visible now for everybody. And is which part of the supply chain is easier to represent in a digital thing? Yeah, exactly. And this is also a very, very typical question which comes uh, in different discussions. How much of our network we can cover when building digital twin? People are uh, voting because... very fast. People are engaged. That's great. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah, because essentially we can describe only what we know, right? Only what is visible for us in physical form or in form of data. So let's give it a, couple, a few more seconds. We yeah. have almost 200 votes already. Um, da, 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 da. OK, let me share the results. There you go. OK, so this is something what is what I also expected. Uh, so especially industrial experts uh, tend to think about digital twin as covering only their own supply chains, own factories, own warehouses. Uh, it, it's People are usually skeptical about describing upstream part or possibility to cover upstream part. And also downstream, it's uh, not always possible. I'm, I'm a little bit curious about customers. Actually, companies know customers, right? So, and why? Only 4% think that customers cannot be uh, covered by digital twin. Okay, but let us uh, let us discuss it uh, a little bit. So basically, it's a lot about visibility, right? As we um, as we discussed, normally uh, companies know the first tier supplier. In some cases, they know second tier supplier. For example, through machine tooling. Um, but they don't know suppliers of suppliers, right? That's why it is a great challenge to describe uh, upstream part and to build digital twin of uh, of the of the supplier base. Uh, there are different approaches uh, how to do it, and one promising approach is uh, data driven building of supply chains, right? In different supplier collaborative portals, in open data spaces, uh, in clouds, uh, we have a lot of data about suppliers, right? So that's why we actually should not contact our suppliers physically, uh, sometimes from data we can uh, we can reproduce, replicate our real upstream network. 
Then downstream, okay, it is logistics, right? Uh, here we can also use some uh, some data about our distribution systems or how our products are distributed. So it's here there are also possibilities. And customers, customers actually uh, should be known to us and not difficult to represent in a digital twin. All right. So now, now let us look uh, the what uh, directions of integration, the simulation and artificial intelligence. And here, basically summarizing different views, different opinions, uh, I think three major elements. First of all, AI supported modeling and analysis. Okay, this is something what we are actually already doing and it is state of the art, right? So analytics-based performance assessment Analysis and management, something like bottleneck identification, uh, so data-driven bottleneck identification. This is what we can do, and uh, a lot of research about it. Or AI-based solution algorithm, right? For example, solving optimization models using uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, a lot of publications on this topic. Uh, second, it's AI supported real-time data. Here it's getting a little bit tricky and not too much research about it, but very important practical topic, how to get uh, data from external systems into digital twins, and also how, uh, how to integrate this data into simulation and optimization model. Maybe it's more computer science topic, right? So, but also very important for supply chain management. And finally, this is something which is very interesting. AI supported model building, right? especially for complex networks like supply chains, uh, visibility can be very low. Uh, and the, the first topic where AI could be used, it is what we name network discovery and data-driven design of digital tweets. Right? So using uh, different, uh, different methods uh, related to, which you know from computer science, also generative AI, uh, it is possible to replicate uh, uh, network data to to create network structures uh, using uh, using buyer supplier relationships data. Uh, the second point is learning based in data driven model building. Right when we uh, when we don't know in advance our constraint system or our objective function of a model, um, this is something what uh, also we know as constraint robust optimization. The same can be done with AI, right? So using data for build or for build the model or make the model more accurate. And finally, very interesting dynamic model adaptation. Right? Like a digital twin um, should replicate real, real supply chain. You know, in real supply chains, there is a lot of dynamics. Suppliers are coming, suppliers are leaving. We should keep these records up to date. And so also our model um, uh, needs adaptation. So I think there are three major directions of uh, which we can expect in the near future related to simulation and AI integration. All right, so this is of uh, what happened now. Now let us uh, look at some future research topic. And here, this is 10% of uh, scientific fantasy, what, what I told at the beginning. So the first one, it's uh, metaverse. All right, so you know, now we mostly look at uh, supply chains as something what is delivering physical products. But maybe in 10 years, uh, companies uh, will operate a lot of uh, digital products supply chain. You know, uh, now, for example, if you want to drive, to drive an expensive uh, sport car like Lamborghini, but you don't have money to buy a Lamborghini but you want to get experience. Right? You go to Metaverse, you put your virtual reality glasses and uh, for $50, you get uh, half an hour experience of driving club or dream, right? But uh, there, there will be also supply chain behind this product, behind the service which is provided to you, right? So digital customers, digital products, uh, digital stores, will also require a combination of digital technology and physical world. So in our recent paper with uh, Alexander Dolgi in IGPI, we just uh, outlined some possible impacts of metaverse on uh, supply chain operations management in future. So if you are interested in this, this is one indicative uh, reference. The second, uh, the second important topic, each, each organizational implementation of digital twins. So, and here, if you look at uh, three levels of, um, of development from data collection to data analytics, 
I think now most of the companies are somehow at the level of data collection. Uh, so building data-driven technology. Uh, many companies uh, look at uh, data-driven organizations. So for example, they aggregate all their data in Google Cloud or somewhere else. But this is not the end of the story, right? So some managers ask me, Dimitri, when we integrated all our data in Google Cloud, do we have digital twin? No. Even if you have your data are there, you should start doing something with this data. That was the third step is data analytics, right? Uh, building digital twin, process mining, generatify, uh, performance management, simulation optimization. So a sort of digital management system and decision making support. Uh, the next topic, which is of interest, it's we name it intertwined supply networks. Uh, we all are supply chain management experts. And we actually rely a lot on traditional definition of a supply chain. Supply chain is a network organization. But in reality, it's very difficult to, to, to differentiate one supply chain from another one. Supply chain is something really abstract. Uh, like computer science experts see supply chain as data, financial data about uh, flows. Right? They even don't look at, at uh, firms who are involved. So there are different views. And intertwined supply network, it's another possibility to look at, uh, at this problem from ecosystem point of view, right? In reality, like automotive, electronics, healthcare supply chains can have the same semiconductor supplier, right? In, in other words, the same company, it's involved with three different supply chains which intersect. So this intertwining effects are, are really interesting. Uh, then something what happens in one of our current projects, which is about manufacturing as a service uh, and the supply chain as a service, right? In other words, in other words, it's about using data spaces. Uh, it's about using supply collaboration portals to 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 develop uh, physical supply chains as a service based on uh, change customer demands and uh, based on possibilities with digital twins uh, offer, offer to us. Uh, another topic, this is uh, really something what I'm interested about now and reading a lot of books about biological systems, uh, uh, replicating supply chain resilience as immune system. Right? Each of us has an immune system. Why? Because we need some protection against external disruptions and we need to recover if we get sick. Isn't, isn't the resilience, right? supply chains resilience doing the same thing, uh, protection and uh, recovery. Right? And if you look more detailed at biological systems, there are many useful ideas which we can borrow uh, for supply chain resilience. Right? For example, biological systems and immune systems have two types of uh, immunity, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Right? Innate immunity is something what we are born with, like skin. And adaptive immunity is something what we uh, what we take during our life, like vaccination, or if we really get sick, uh, uh, we learn how our our immune system learns how to cope with particular viruses. So the same uh, we can make a lot a lot of analogies with uh, supply chains and uh, develop develop new new algorithms, new uh, capabilities for supply chain resilience. Yes, and uh, finally, before closing, uh, Internet of Behaviors, right? So essentially, if you look at uh, what companies are doing with data, they track our activities, they collect data, they analyze data, so create information. But then more, most important, uh, companies try to understand and influence our behavior. Right? So, uh, so this Internet of Behaviors can have uh, multiple uh, multiple implications, uh, starting from impacting our purchasing behavior uh, up to contracting and negotiations with suppliers, sourcing, purchasing, managing, and so on. Yeah, so this is uh, basically what happened. Um, now, now we are our my team is involved with uh, three projects. Uh, one, uh, two of them are European Horizon uh, projects. Uh, about uh, manufacturing as a service with digital twins on ecosystems and agriculture, the supply chain resilience, also using digital twins and stress testing. And the third project is uh, from uh, German Research Foundation, new collaborative research center on resilience of global supply chain. 
So I hope uh, next time when uh, I am honored to, to be invited again to speak uh, in this series, I can report more about uh, about results of uh, of these projects. Yes, so when you got interested in uh, in any logistics simulation, uh, just in two weeks, I am running uh, academic webinar on any logistics. So please don't hesitate to to register for this uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, to summarize, uh, basically in this talk, I tried to show that digital technology and resilience are transforming supply chains. They were reconfigurable, adaptable, and resilience uh, centric networks. Right? So uh, digital technology can enable end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. And a combination of simulation and AI helps us to build digital twins and implementing a transition from data collection to digital twin-based management systems. And there are quite a few future areas like uh, transition to online modeling, human eye collaboration, looking not only on resilience, but also on viability of supply chains and intertwined networks, uh, metaverse and cloud supply chain as a service, immune system. Yes, and essentially it's very interesting to understand how a future supply chain manager will take decisions using all these technological advancements uh, which uh, we offer. Before closing, again, maybe we can run our last poll. Final poll, all right. So it should be available for everybody now. So it's, now it's a, what's a realistic scope of a digital supply chain twin? So if people have actually paid attention uh, in the webinar, they should be answering this <laughs> quietly. Yeah, I would say that it's no correct or wrong answer to this question, right? It really depends on the organization, on the supply chain considered, uh, technological development of a company experience with uh, with networks, um, artificial intelligence, simulation. Uh, I'm curious what... Uh, we what have over 150 votes already, so maybe we can start sharing the results. Actually, in that line of what you were sharing, some of the questions that we are getting and that we will channel into you at the yeah. end are referring to that level of maturity in terms of uh, digital twins. Also, and some people are asking, Actually, which industries do you see out there that are uh, more advanced in, in this? So, But before that, I'm going to be sharing the poll, so maybe you can connect the, the dots there. So let me... You should be seeing the results now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's uh, really good that our audience is so optimistic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, sees that we can cover the whole network. Uh, yeah, so which is uh, which is great, but yeah, as you as you say, Miguel, uh, we might have some related questions. Uh, that's why I would not comment too detail on these uh, responses. And we can, yeah, we can uh, basically start uh, a discussion. Thank you for listening to me. No, thank you, Professor Dimitri. This was great. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. We are going to start and um, going one by one. Uh, first, actually, I wanted to ask. Uh, a question related to some of the research that we do here at MIT, because, for example, now we are looking at cyber attacks as one of the uh, more important type of disruptions that can happen in modern supply chains related to, for example, the cloud transformation that you mentioned um, and all the connectivity in, in, the main, in all the systems, both from the automation perspective, the equipment, but also the software. And so... I'm wondering when you're looking at some of these like new types of disruptions that maybe you know they haven't been um, affected in the past much supply chains, so you don't have a lot of historical data of what the impact can be. Uh, how did you uh, go in terms of defining, for example, that disruption uh, scenario that you were mentioning? You know, like how how did you make those first steps uh, towards building a, a good simulation model for it? Yeah, exactly. This is a fantastic question. So there are two basic approaches to this, and they depend on the type of uncertainty we consider, because we have known known and we have unknown unknown. For known known, uh, we can use predictions, we can use past experience, we can use uh, past data. And I know that every summer there are typhoons and tsunamis in uh, South Asia. If I have my facilities there, I can prepare, I can build up inventory, I can use subcontracting somewhere else in the world, and uh, I'm good. 
So uh, this is something what I would even see not as resilience, but rather as classical risk management, right? because it's just no, no uh, probability based uh, preparedness. It's getting tricky if we talk about unknown, unknown. Uh, how how you can predict uh, something what you even <laughs> even don't know what will happen. So and in this case, uh, my recommendation is to focus on the system, but not in the and not on the environment. And this is a new approach to resilience, which I'm trying to develop because environment in unknown, unknown, it's unpredictable. Uh, that's why the only hope is to develop adaptable, flexible practices in everyday business, you know, like multi-sourcing, omni-channel distribution, uh, using uh, some, uh, some visibility technologies uh, for, for data mapping, for supply chain mapping. Uh, yeah, something like the flexible manufacturing system, selecting resilient suppliers. So yeah, adding, adding resilience and flexibility inside the system. And then hoping that uh, if we are able to manage this adaptability in the system, we can react uh, to different types of disruptions which are coming without predicting them in advance. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a, a really, really a good approach when you have so much uncertainty uh, at the end of the day, like working on your own processes uh, and your, your own mitigation strategies and, and recovery process. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, great. So yeah, this is uh, definitely an interesting topic. We've got over 20 questions in the Q&A, so hopefully we get to as many as possible. Uh, but you know, one of the, the first ones we got, and there was a question, I was like, what is the optimal level of granularity? Is there some kind of sweet spot in the modeling? Because we can dive down into the weeds and not everything works or we too abstract. So how would you define that sweet spot, doctor? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. Because uh, it's also related to our last question in the poll, how much we can cover in the digital twin. And I think uh, there should be something like uh, exponential growth of complexity if we're getting uh, closer to 100% of coverage. Uh, that's why something like covering maybe or selecting the most important parts of the network, which, represent, which make our digital twin model representative. Uh, this can be done maybe with the help of information theory, where we could identify uh, most, uh, most incentive, most uh, productive information sharing channels in the network and try to represent exactly these companies in the network. So my perception is we should look at, say, 80% of 80-90% uh, of uh, uh, companies um, which would allow us uh, to, to be close to 100% of accuracy. Right, so it is like with ABC classification in inventory management, right? So when we like 80% 80 of uh, products, 20% uh, uh, of products create 80% of cost. I think the same here, 20% of, com of companies would create 80% of effort to represent uh, digital twin uh, correctly. Awesome, great. Yeah, the old Pareto principle comes home. Yeah, for sure. All right, Miguel, another question from you? Yeah, so this question comes from uh, one of uh, our people in the audience, Tomoki Ohno, and this learner is asking, when you're making uh, supply chain uh, risk management decisions, like, do you think it's actually necessary to go through all the factors that are, uh, or elements that are included in the system to, for example, make the recommendations? And this is, I think this learning is relating to the explainability of, of the models. Because, um, for example, now with all the new AI tools, you mentioned some of them, uh, this is also becoming a hot topic in terms of are we going to be making so many decisions based on a black box? Or are we actually uh, going to try to make it more explainable and go through all the factors that affect that final result of the simulation or the final uh, like scenario? Yeah. Yeah, this is a great question. So when we when we go to companies and make workshops about digital twin senior logistics, uh, most of the companies say, okay, we need a tool which would help us to make decision in case of disruption. In other words, your model should tell us what to do if we have a disruption. So, so people think AI, it's a magic, right? Then I'm asking, so based on what? Our tool should prepare, should, should, should propose you some decisions. So uh, you should, yeah. So that's why AI, AI, it's not a magic. Uh, AI, it's more or less uh, ontology plus statistics. 
right? And uh, that's why first uh, you should uh, be able to, to develop a sort of ontology, a sort of knowledge management graph uh, using previous experiences in the company about uh, managing uh, disruptions, for example. And then, and then use some statistical tools, you know, which would uh, help you statistical, maybe other tools, simulation tools, uh, optimization tools, which would help you to select uh, the right strategy for the, for the concrete scenario, right? Uh, but again, I think uh, it, it's about human and AI collaboration. There are some standard situations which AI can manage very well, but there are some unknown, unknown or unique situations where AI can provide some support, but uh, we definitely need a human who will be able to estimate all this variety of factors which, uh, which are simply not included in the, in the AI. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the answer. Yes. Yeah, so the, the next question is uh, from Izet, and how can we use digital technologies to improve supply chain sustainability? Is that being used now, or is it all risk and resilience, or is sustainability an element we're looking at, too? Yeah, this is a great question. So first of all, we should understand what do we mean under sustainability? It is just CO2 emission, or is it something more? Right? If we look at supply chain viability, uh, the new concept which we defined, viability is actually resilience plus sustainability. But sustainability from society point of view, for example, if one supply chain goes bankrupt, it is a problem of this supply chain, of course, a problem of business. But we don't think about how many jobs will be lost if one supply chain uh, is not resilient. right? So that's why also looking at this society aspect, uh, it's uh, very, very, very important in terms, of, in terms of resilience. And then, of course, many resilience capabilities are strongly correlated to sustainability issues, right? If we introduce more, say, global footprint, uh, if we introduce uh, more warehouses is like backups, of course, we increase our environmental impact, which uh, should be well balanced. Uh, yeah, totally agree that sustainability should be considered when making many resilience decisions. Great, thanks. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, let's take one more question. Uh, so this one comes from Ambridge uh, Sign. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Um, this person is asking about the um, importance uh, and usage of uh, scenario-based simulations within uh, the kind of models that you presented. Um, I think it's actually some, uh, a pretty important question because the learner is asking how do you, uh, do you approach them to actually make it um, easy to you know, prepare these models, not end up with like 150 different uh, models out there. So how did you actually go uh, and select the right maybe scenarios that you want to run and how to make this a continuous process in the organization for decision making? Yeah, this is one of the key questions. So when, develop, when we develop a digital twin, we actually look at two major areas, uh, model, so network, uh, and scenarios. Right? Uh, to develop network, we need some visibility, right? It can be direct uh, direct contacts with suppliers to understand who is suppliers to whom, or it can be data-driven discovery of our uh, supplier base, for example. And the second area are scenarios. And here there are many approaches, like uh, there are something like what we name social simulation. Social simulation means when you get on one table experts, from different parts of organization, but also from suppliers, from logistic companies. And they all together, you know, make a sort of brainstorming and uh, develop uh, some of potential crisis scenario, which can be dangerous for supply chain, or even for the whole manufacturing industry of one continent, like European, you know, these many initiatives with European manufacturing resilience. They do such social simulations with policy makers also. Uh, and uh, this is one approach to develop uh, to develop scenarios. So from from ex expert based uh, development. And second approach is, is data driven, right? If we have past data about previous disruptions, we can generate it from from data. Nice. Thank you so much for the answer, Jeff. Do you want to take one more question before we wrap it up? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so there was a, a question about um, what are the main industries that are lever leveraging digital twins right now? Is it more practical or is there, is there an industry that's really going to needs to adopt this sooner rather than later? Yeah, so I can, uh, I, I think there are many industries which are interested and are doing something in this area. I can report only from my, uh, my own practical experience. So we are doing projects with automotive, aerospace and agriculture. 
I would say it's uh, the whole ecosystem, right? Aerospace ecosystem, automotive ecosystem, and agriculture ecosystem. And uh, especially in yeah, especially in aerospace and automotive, uh, also given their whole history and the you know multi multi echelon networks and a lot of technological advancements, uh, yeah. So many many of these firms are very good uh, in terms of developing digital twins, and some of them even already have something what you can more or less name a digital twin. Some some years of work are still ahead. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's time for us to, to wrap up. We we had many more questions, but uh, we're on time and we want to be really respectful <laughs> with everybody here. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Dimitri Vanoff. Uh, thank you so much, everybody uh, who decided to join us today. It's been a super insightful session on how digital twins and AI can actually help shape modern supply chains uh, and model uh, resilience in a better way. And before we say goodbye, I just want to remind the audience a couple of things. So first, this was the last live event of the fall series. Uh, has been a huge pleasure for Jeff and I uh, to have been co-hosting this and just the sharing the experience with all of you. Second, uh, several uh, supply team uh, courses uh, from our MicroMasters are still open for enrollment. So for those actually completing SC1X and SC3X, remember that these two courses uh, are actually going to be followed by SC2X and SC4X, respectively, the next courses in the MicroMasters pathway. And they are going to be starting pretty soon, uh, right after uh, the winter holidays. So you guys can take a break uh, also in December. Um, but yeah, so we encourage you to check them out and continue your path in the MicroMasters in supply chain management. Remember, verifying for the courses is really important for us. It's the only way to get a certificate from MIT and also the best way to support the program uh, so we can continue to do this for free and for everybody around the world. So if you like the content, please verify it so we can uh, keep doing this for you. And once again, thank you everybody for the support. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Kara. also. And um, if you guys want to share some final words, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thanks a lot uh, for the invite. I'm very happy about uh, the ongoing collaboration with uh, MIT CTL. Uh, we already, already have some uh, joint papers and uh, some nice projects uh, in developing. Yeah, hope this session was useful and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present our recent uh, results and insights. Uh, great organization. Uh, Miguel, Jeff, Kyle, thanks a lot. All right. No, you're, you're, you're most welcome, Professor. And it was an honor to, to listen to this. I know this uh, this topic was a huge interest to a lot of people here. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone else, for attending. We appreciate you taking an hour out of your day uh, to, to join us. Uh, you're all busy, so we, we appreciate that. Please continue to engage with us at live events, on social media, and in the discussion forums. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Have a great one. Bye-bye.